Tell us a little bit more about ADSS. What makes it special? Why can we utilize it? Um, you know, what are its advantages? Just kind of walk us through that, maybe with the history and, and how AFL's involved in that. Um, ADSS is a technology that will allow the co-ops or anybody who owns a power right away to utilize a space that only you have and only you can access, only you can maintain it, so which will give you uh, reliability and the location of the ADSS cable. Nobody else will be able to touch that cable except you. So that will give you protection for your fibers, as well as Chad said, is going to help you also to reduce your bank credit because you don't have to deal with clearances in that, in that space. There's another point that is very important that ADSS will bring is the maintenance. So we need to think about that we're building a network that is not going to be there for 10 years or five years. We'll be building a network like the concept, follow the power, to make sure that it will last at least the same amount of years that you, you exist in infrastructure. Is. So ADSS is a technology that is being there for 10 plus years. It's a technology that a lot of companies are being using. It's a technology, technology that it will allow you to be flexible, to move from the power space to the supply zone, I'm sorry, to, to the supply zone, to the comp space as you need it. So it's a technology that will give you that flexibility and it will give you that lifespan of uh, 20 plus years of life. So when we're utilizing potentially this design ADSS fiber and we're worried about getting a lot of fiber up there, we're serving very rural areas, there's a lot of different technologies that can encompass that. So. Chad, real fast, um, there's a few technologies out there you can leverage from, from active designs to passive designs. What is What do you see, at least especially from a cooperative or municipality standpoint, as far as designing the network to conserve fiber? What type of route does that normally follow? An active or a passive? Or a... Yeah, generally, uh, you're going to be in a passive optical network design. Um, you know, active is, is a possibility if you're municipality and you've got the density sorted, um, but nearly every co-op that I've come across, uh, the density wouldn't justify uh, an active kind of network. Uh, the spend on the amount of fiber that you would need is just too high. Um, and you're far more efficient design, uh, design with passive optical network, especially in low dense environments. Now, for those of you that don't know, we have someone in here that has a general understanding of Han and how it works. Ryan, so if we have a, looking at a pond network, can you, someone mentioned it earlier, I can't remember, a few people mentioned it actually, the fiber doesn't change, something changes on each end, the electronics in this example. If we were to build out this pond network, maybe give us a little education, I guess, on pond and then what, what does that allow us to do and does it provide us with limitations going into the future? Is this a network that we can grow with? Sure, the, the, the primary things that, that pond gives you are, lower electronics cost and, and lower um, fiber consumption. Um, so, so the idea in, in a passive network is that back at, at the, the, the central location, whatever hub site that you're putting your centralized electronics in, you are, you're sending signals to a, a number of subscribers out over a single fiber that then goes to a splitter somewhere else. And that, that signal gets split out to go to you know, 32 homes or, or 64 homes, depending on the, the, the technology decisions uh, that you make there. What that gives you is efficiency in, in that feeder fiber. I don't, I don't any longer have to have a single fiber for every customer going all the way back uh, to my central site. Um, I, can, I, I can pack more customers on, on a single fiber there. And the other thing that it gives me back at that central site is uh, a savings on the equipment side. So if, if I had a single fiber for a customer per customer, I would have to terminate that back into my central electronics every single fiber, and there's, an, uh, there's a cost to having um, uh, optics, uh, a, a laser and, and receiver uh, on the central side for every single customer. Uh, and in a pod network, you, you again have one of those ports for every 16 or 32 or 64 customers, uh, however you, you decide to do that. So, um, from, a, from just a pure electronics cost perspective, um, the, the break even happens very, very quickly, somewhere around eight to 10 subscribers uh, on a fiber. Uh, 
begins uh, to get to get cheaper after that point for pine, and that's why, uh, along with the outside plant design considerations that Chad talked about, that's why anybody that's building uh, a network of any size, really anywhere in the world, uh, is using pine. If you look at AT and T where they're building fiber, that's all pine. Um, Verizon where they've built fiber, that's all pine. Um, any kind of operators anywhere else in the world, Europe, China, Central America, South America, uh, anytime that, that you're building a network that's, uh, that, that's more than, than a very small size and, and you're building it with your own money, uh, you, you use Pine because of the efficiency there. Um, one common question that we get on that is, uh, okay, if I'm sharing uh, this fiber uh, among several customers, what does that do to the service that I'm able to offer? How much bandwidth can I get over that? Um, fortunately, the, the bandwidth of, of fiber is, from a practical perspective, nearly unlimited. And it, it really depends on what electronics you put at either end to um, light up that fiber and put a signal over that fiber, and that depends. Uh, that determines uh, what service you're able to offer. So um, the, the technology that's been mainstream for several years now is, is called G-Pine, and it gives you uh, two and a half gigs uh, in the downstream direction toward the customer uh, that's, that's shared across the, the way people usually deploy it, about 32 customers. But not everybody is using all of the capacity uh, at the same time, so they, they can burst very high. So the, I have AT&T fiber service at home. I have a one gig service. It's delivered over that technology, and I've never been able to do a speed test and get it to, to go less than um, 900 and something megs, which is about the limits of, of what I can do on, on my computer at home. Uh, so. Uh, the, that same principle operates in, in all kinds of different networks, from the telephone network um, all, all the way on down. Um, you know, it used to a long time ago, you would hear all kinds of uh, uh, hear things about Mother's Day. More people make telephone calls on Mother's Day uh, than any other time. That's when the telephone network uh, gets congested because because more people are on it. Um, any other time, not everybody's on the phone uh, all the time, and so you, you have that that. Uh, Efficiency that comes from that shared uh, that shared medium, uh, but if you look at where pond technologies are going, the the roadmap for those in terms of the speeds that they're able to deliver um, goes much much higher than what we're using today. Ten gig technologies that are shared across those same number of customers uh, are becoming mainstream uh, really this year and next year. Uh, there are technologies that go to forty gigs and eighty gigs, and and we're in standards definition right now for fifty and. So uh, if you put a pond network out there and take advantage uh, of that efficiency both in, in your electronics cost as well as your fiber cost, um, you can be very confident that you're going to be able to keep up uh, with, with technology needs and with the bandwidth needs of, of your customers um, even through that, that shared fiber infrastructure. So Ryan hit a lot about bandwidth speeds, member services, different items that we can offer over that. Um, Katie hit earlier when we first kicked off on electrical efficiencies or efficiencies for the electric system, how they're going to save money, how they're going to utilize that infrastructure in a way that's going to allow them to offer really lower rates at the end if they lower their cost or how long their outages are and so on. So still kind of looking at the pond designer idea, typically when people start to look at the network and how they're going to design electric infrastructure management, um, they might have a different view of that. Um, Chad, do you think Pond has a place for electric infrastructure management? And if so, just kind of talk us through your thoughts on that. Oh yeah, it, it definitely has. A, it, it definitely has a, a real application there, um, especially for like a fiber optic scale overlay kind of network. Uh, if you're looking at uh, pulling fiber, all, I mean, if you're going to build broadband network, this is something you're probably already thinking about. Uh, anyway, but pulling it out to your AMI collectors, uh, reclosers, um, since you already have, if you're going to build a fiber optic network, go ahead and do that. One of the problems you run into, uh, sort of traditional designs for, for a network like this, are either kind of like an active E kind of network. Uh, and the problem, of course, with that is, is you're, burning, you're utilizing a single fiber strand for every device that you're connected to in the field. Uh, sometimes they'll They'll, they'll back up and punt a little bit, and they'll try to implement some sort of ring type design where they'll actually put part of switches in the field and try to build rings to try to conserve fiber that way. But there are ways of using pond um, 
for this type of network. That one can give you both the advantages of the efficiency of a pond network, but also the resiliency um, that you need in terms of uh, failover and, and redundancy. So just on limited to those broadband applications or not limited to the power applications and kind of going in that same same vein, you know, we mentioned it's not just about broadband services in the rural America telephone and depending on where you are, video services either are very important. Now how those services are delivered or up for debate, whether it's video or, or phone services now, but as we look in the rural communities, phone is still a very important aspect of that. Um, I travel a lot in rural communities and my cell phone doesn't work half the time. And any of you that spent any time on the phone with me know that I'm like, all right, I'll probably lose you here in about 15 minutes, I'll call you back at 20. So there's, there's a big place for that that comes into it. Um, now, there's a lot of ways you can do something. And I'd like to have Bobby kind of explain to us what you can do voice-wise. What are the different methodologies that maybe you can put voice over your network and what the advantages or disadvantages would be to each. Sure. So there's a couple of different ways that you can have voice on your network. One of which is the oldest way is to facilitate and actually have a switch sit within your central office and every all the traffic goes through that switch that sits right there. Um, with voice over IP, you don't have to have that switch sit on site anymore. With voice over IP, you can have switches that are out in the cloud. Uh, there's uh, more than enough, the technology allows you not to have to do that. So by not doing that, by having the switches out in the cloud and not having it into your, in your facility, you don't have to worry about maintaining that hardware, you don't have to worry about upgrading that hardware, technology is changing constantly. Technology is changing every four to five months. Every four months, five months, we're doing upgrades or all companies doing upgrades on their voice switches. You wouldn't have to do that if your voice switch is out in the cloud. Yeah, so um, is there any time that you would be required to, to have a facility-based switch or is there, a, is there any advantages from a redundancy standpoint to uptime or availability as an electric provider? Uptime is of the highest concern. Now if you, if the only, the only advantage to having a facility based switch would be if uh, you've lost your internet connection completely, you lost your pipe coming in and you weren't able to get an internet, your internet connection uh, back out to the world, then uh, your local folks would be able to call each other because they would technically be on net, so they would be on your fiber internally. So when you set up a fiber network, the way they were talking about fiber is going to run out, you're going to get uh, 10 meg from some place, you're going to get uh, 10 meg from some place else. If you lose those lines, then the folks that are within your community will be able to call each other. They won't be able to call outside that, but they'll be able to call each other, if that makes sense. Is there any way to facilitate that with a voice over IP solution? Sure. Yeah, we can put a, there's something called a session border control, an SBC. If we had an S, if there's an SBC that sits within your central office, then it would work the same way as a phone switch, and you can have that same functionality if you lost that connection to the outside world. So, kind of staying with, with voice just for a second, jumping back over to Chad. As, you know, Chad, I know, has worked on a lot of feasibility studies in that. Um, do you feel like voice plays a small role, a big role, a medium role? Is it important when we're looking at the feasibility of you know paying back this network that's being built and providing services over it? Uh, yeah, it does definitely play a role. Um, the residential voice play, not as much, uh, but definitely the commercial. Uh, you still have a significant amount of businesses out there that still have a lot of landline service, uh, a lot of T1, a lot of PRI, still out there in the network. Um, so actually it's probably a little different than what you're expecting. The residential voice play is not going to be that big, but it's the business voice that's going to be much more substantial from a, from a cash flow perspective. Excellent. So we're looking at providing these services, voice, data, and some smart grid services that sound like it. Well, a lot of this is going to come down to how the customer feels about it. Um, we call that customer experience a lot of times how the customer perceives your network. Um, I know everyone in the room here, especially from an electric provider standpoint, feels like you have excellent customer service. Couldn't agree more. 
I think anybody that's ever lived in an area that has an electric cooperative or a municipality compared to one that maybe doesn't, they feel the home, the homeness of it. The fact that they can call someone, they can get them on the phone, they can take care of that. So when you're jumping into a different avenue, whether it's the telecommunications in this place, how are you going to provide that same customer service? Now, there's a lot of development, there's a lot of technology that's going to allow us to do that. And Ryan, you know, there's a lot of different electronics involved, there's a lot of different wireless things and things like that. So, you know, how have the electronics side of the business or just the, the boxes we can put in the house really helped to guarantee the customer has a great experience or a world-class experience? Part of that, uh, the biggest part of that, especially uh, in the last few years, has been the, the Wi-Fi that you can put in the home. I know, I know my kids, my kids don't understand, they don't draw a distinction between the service coming into the house and, and the Wi-Fi. If something is wrong, the Wi-Fi is out. Um, and, and most, most of, of, uh, of your customer base is the same way. If the Wi-Fi doesn't deliver um, what I'm expecting it to for, for whatever reason, there's interference from a neighbor, I've got different devices that aren't, aren't configured correctly inside my home, uh, even if you had nothing to do with that, uh, it, it's always, something's wrong with the Wi-Fi, I'm going to call the service provider because they're the one that's, that's bringing the signal to me. Um, so being able to um, offer uh, more advanced devices uh, inside the home that can, number one, deliver wirelessly the kind of bandwidth that you're, that you're selling to these customers, um, but number two, be able to um, help you fix problems uh, as they come up without having to roll a truck out there and have someone go look and, and, and try to diagnose the problem on site. If, if step one, you can diagnose problems uh, sitting, sitting back at your operations center when someone calls in, um, you have the technology to, to be able to look and say, okay, there are a bunch of different kind of devices in this home. The, the Wi-Fi gateway is telling me that there's interference on this channel. Let's move to another channel and, and we should improve performance. Or um, your, your device that you're trying to, to stream uh, video to is, is on uh, uh, your, your 2.5 or 2.4 gigahertz wireless when it really shouldn't be on the 5 gigahertz because there's so much uh, better speed there. Um, being able to see these problems and diagnose them remotely is very important to delivering the, the customer experience uh, that they expect because, uh, you know, for, for the most part, they don't understand the, the details of, of that technology. So if you, can, if you can take that for them and solve those problems for them and solve those problems remotely without having to, to come in and, and roll a truck, then you have a much better customer experience. The next step in that is, is applying artificial intelligence and machine learning to those kind of problems and that big uh, amount of data that you're able to see from uh, devices inside the home and solve problems before someone calls in. And, and that's where we're doing a lot of work uh, on, on both the devices that, that go inside the home as well as analytics software that sits uh, either in your network or, or up in the cloud that looks at all that data, crunches all that data, and finds things that are about to be problems and fixes them before uh, someone calls in. Uh, those, that's what's really becoming key to the customer experience, uh, especially as we, we go to speeds that are, uh, that are available on fiber. Uh, it becomes much more of a big deal. Uh, versus uh, what we were seeing with, with cable modems or, or DSLs several years ago.